Thank you, worship team. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to New Life E Free on this beautiful Sunday morning. Thank you so much for being here with us this morning. Would you grab your bulletin, please? I have maybe an unusually large amount of content to get through with you, uh, a little bit more than usual, but uh, a couple key things to note for our church family as we approach the coming weeks ahead. First of all, if you just look kind of in the, the center panel of the announcements, right at the top there, want to just verbally highlight that uh, in two weeks, uh, Sunday, November 6th, right after the uh, morning service here, we're going to have a very brief, maybe 10-minute informational meeting for anyone interested in our greeter hospitality ministry, okay? And that meeting in particular is just dealing with Sunday morning. Traditionally, we might say Sunday morning greeters, okay? If that interests you, Again, just a very brief meeting on Sunday, November 6th to just kind of explain what that looks like. We are burdened as elders that we need to get that started again. And, and so the meeting does not obligate you to serve in that way, but if you're at all interested, it would be good for you to be there and just kind of hear what that's all about. Uh, next, I'd like to direct your attention to the different inserts in our bulletin. The first one is our elder nomination process. That has been ongoing. That started back in August. And uh, a lot to read through there, but I, I want to highlight a couple things and then ask you just to make sure that you uh, read through that on your own completely. A couple things to be aware of. First of all, in that first paragraph, uh, the elders, you'll see there, have adopted a one-year break for those who have served in that capacity for uh, two full terms. I uh, just feel like that's a, a healthy approach for the individual man and for the church as a whole. And so you'll notice uh, Daryl Victorine has reached that mark for the first time, and so that will apply to him. And then Jim Halas after this year, and then each man uh, down through the line. So be aware of that. And then secondly, if you'll notice, there's two names on there, and those men have uh, agree both uh, been asked, nominated by you, the body, have been asked to consider, and have agreed to continue in the process. So <coughs> if you just look right after those two names, we now enter the stage where two things are happening with these men. Number one, we as elders are working with them on what it, it could look like for them to serve. And then number two, this is the time that we often call kind of the feedback period. So if you have questions, if you have concerns, if you have comments about those two men, 
you have the next two weeks until Sunday, November 6th to talk to, and that would be any of the current elders, so myself, Jim Halas, or Daryl Victorine, okay? That's all I'll say verbally. I would encourage you, though, to read through the whole thing. Uh, I, I hope it's good information for you. The next insert, just a quick reminder of our packing party three weeks from today. We look forward to that. There's a list of things that we could still use. In the red, I would highlight that uh, notes are needed for the shoe boxes. If you have any questions about that, you can see a member of the OCC team. And then on the next side, the, the, the back side of that flyer, a reminder of our Christmas outreach. Great response so far from the body. Thank you for that. But I know, um, I, I believe some game leaders maybe could still be used. Uh, if you want to talk to Amy or Tolly or Andy or Jana, and, and just say, hey, how can I help? What needs are still out there? Uh, please do so. That's coming up on Saturday, November 19th. That is all for announcements this morning. Uh, Daryl Victorine is going to come as one of our elders and lead us in the reading of Scripture and in prayer. Thank you, Daryl. All right, if you want to follow along, you can turn to Psalm 150, the very last of all the Psalms. The reason I chose this today is because we're going to sing a new song here in a few minutes, and um, it is based on this psalm. So uh, it, if you'll notice, when I get to the end of it, reading it, it says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And that's a line we'll see in the song we're going to learn here in a minute. So let me read Psalm 150, and then we'll pray. <clears throat> praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we do enjoy and love praising you. Um, thinking of all the creation you've made and uh, knowing from scripture that it all testifies praise to you. Uh, everything we see, all the great and mighty powers out there in nature that we can't control and all the minute details of of the building blocks of life itself, it, all of these things point to you, and all of these things cause us to praise you, um, draw our minds to you, draw our hearts to you, bow our heads before you. Uh, you're the maker of all things, including ourselves. It is you who has made us, not we ourselves. And so as we continue to sing, I just, I pray you'd be lifted up and glorified and that as we sing, our hearts would be toward you and not toward ourselves and not toward whatever's going on in, in the kingdoms of this world, but in, uh, on your, your kingdom, your agenda, your mission, mm -hmm. your purposes, and your person, who you are, oh God. We lift you up and praise you. We pray your blessing on the, the time as we look into your word today, uh, your blessing on the people who have given or will give in the offering today. Uh, your, your blessing on each one as we share our, our spiritual gifts with one another and, and, and seek to build one another up. Um, God, I just pray that all the matters of the church would give praise to you today. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I think there was a theme in that psalm of praise. <laughs> And that's what we want to do now, and this is Psalm 150, so this is a song based off that. Would you stand with us as we praise God and continue in our worship service? You made the starry host, you traced the mountain Yes. 
Good morning, everyone. I would ask you to keep that um, theme in mind of what we just sang, the holiness of our God. It's going to be a major theme of our study this morning. This morning, we begin a brand new series on the book of Haggai. I, I would ask you to just take a moment, if you would, please, and, and find that in God's word, the book of Haggai. I will make it easy for you if you are using a, a Bible here in the sanctuary. It's on page 743, so 743. I believe actually the page doesn't have that number on it, so if you find 742, you can do the math and add one and find Haggai. Uh, if you have your own copy, Haggai is a small book uh, that is third to last in the entire Old Testament. And so if you find the space kind of between the Old and New Testaments and then begin to flip backwards, you will go through Malachi and Zechariah and then you will find Haggai. We need to do a little shift in our minds, folks, as we begin our study today. We just finished looking at the book of Habakkuk. Now we need to shift to Haggai. Similar name, you've got to distinguish in your mind Habakkuk and Haggai, and then you throw in the book Hosea as well. You've got a lot of H prophets in there. Similar name, Habakkuk, last study, Haggai, this study. But we need to do a little mental shift together because as we will see, Haggai is a very different book in many ways from our last study. This morning is going to serve as an introduction to the book of Haggai. Over the next six Sundays, we're going to study this Old Testament prophetic book together. It will take us right up to the Christmas season. My plan is to do a brief series on Christmas in the month of December. Russ Matthews, Lord willing, will be with us on December 11th, one of the missionaries that we support. Look forward to that. But up until about that time in December, we will be studying this wonderful book of Haggai together. Haggai is a hidden gem in God's Word. It is truly both hidden and a gem. It is a wonderful book full of practical truths for our lives and our relationship with Christ, and yet it is often hidden. It's small. We, we don't know much about the author. We might have even a hard time pronouncing his name. Uh, we may not often flip to it when it comes time to consider what we are reading in our time with the Lord. Uh, it is often a hidden book, but it is a wonderful book in God's Word. And I pray as we study it that you will be as encouraged as I have been reading it. Today I want to introduce you to this hidden gem of Haggai. As you know by now, when we start a new book together, I like to take a Sunday at the beginning and just sort of introduce the book. And so we're going to do that together this morning through two introductions. First of all, we will introduce ourselves to Haggai and his book. Secondly, we're going to take time to introduce God and his temple. You say, the temple, what in the world are we talking about the temple for? Well, before we dive into Haggai, we really need to get a handle on the temple in God's word. It is a critical idea to understand if we are going to understand the book of Haggai. 
And so we're going to take time today to remind ourselves of the different stages of the temple as it is seen in God's word. So those are the two introductions that we will do, an introduction to Haggai and his book and to God and his temple. Father, I pray that as uh, Psalm 119 says, Uh, that your word is a delight to us, that you would open our eyes to the riches of your word. Lord, that would be a reflection of our heart this morning. Show us and and, and prepare us as we dive into the text of, of this book of Haggai. Just show us what is important for us to have our minds around. And Lord, may we delight in your word. We thank you for it. We thank you for uh, your people gathered here. We, I, I thank you for the one who is here or listening later and, and, and they don't know Christ as their Savior. Um, our prayer for them and including those names that are in the box before me here that we've committed to praying for this year. Our prayer is that uh, you, Holy Spirit, would bring conviction of sin and open their eyes to the glorious Savior that we have, Jesus. It's in his name that we pray these things. Amen. Amen. All right, let's start by introducing ourselves to Haggai in his book. We are going to do this by looking at two things in this section. First of all, the setting of this book, and then a bit about the author of this book. So let's start with the setting, if you would jot down the word setting. As you can see, if you have the book of Haggai open in your lap, you can see that Haggai is one of the shortest books in all of the Bible. It's just two chapters long. In fact, 38 verses in total split between those two chapters. One very important thing we need to note, and I would have you write this down if you're taking notes, Haggai is one of three Old Testament prophets who wrote during the post-exile period. Let's remind ourselves of the timeline a little bit here, and then I will mention those three authors by name. The Old Testament starts, of course, with the book of Genesis. You have creation. Try to follow along. It's kind of going through the, the red headings right now. Starts with creation, the fall of man into sin, the global flood, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Jacob, Israel's 12 sons. You have the Israelites enslaved in Egypt. You have the exodus through Moses. You have the settling of the promised land led by Joshua and then the age of the judges. We enter then into the United Kingdom period where Israel is led by kings Saul, David, and Solomon. And then after Solomon, you recall, we entered the divided kingdom period. Now, those of you who were with us for our study of Habakkuk, you should recognize that terminology. Habakkuk was set in the divided kingdom period. Israel is split into two. Israel kept the name uh, in the northern country. Judah was in the south. And that period ends with both of those countries, listen, all 12 tribes of Israel being sent into exile by God because of their sin. Israel to Assyria, Judah to where? Babylon, thank you, which is what Habakkuk foresaw, we noticed in our last study. Now, here's where I would have you start to listen very carefully, folks. (coughs) The Israelites of Judah are in Babylon. They are exiles there for 70 years. This chunk, let's just say, represents 70 years. In that period of time, you have Esther. You have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You have Daniel in the lion's den, the handwriting on the wall. This is all happening while Israel is in exile in Babylon. But then listen, folks. Just as God said through the prophet Jeremiah, God allows his people to be freed and to return to the promised land after those 70 years. 
the historical record of that, of those returns, are in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. The Israelites return in three waves. Do you see the, the green three returns there noted towards the end? They come back in three waves, each one with a different emphasis and goal. And listen, it is within that time frame, as you can see the next green below there, that we have these three different post-exile prophets ministering in the Old Testament. They are speaking for God to the Israelites who return to Jerusalem from exile in Babylon, and they are Zechariah and Malachi and our Haggai. Which, by the way, are the three last books of the Old Testament. One final thought to keep in mind that might be helpful, and I would have you write this down. This is key for us as we dive in next week. By the time that Haggai was writing this book and the events of this book, the Israelites in these three returns, right? Right here. By the time he's writing, we are 16 years away from the first people coming back. The people have been back for 16 years years by the events of this book. Please remember that. That's 2006 by our equivalent, 16 years. They've been back for a while. They've settled. They've had time to get things in order, (laughs) to work on things. And yet with all of that time, 16 years, some things have been neglected, some very important things. Keep all of this in mind, please, as we open the text next week. They have been back for 16 years. It's a little bit about the setting of the book. Would you write this down? Let's look now at the author, Haggai, the man himself. The truth is we know very little about him. Outside of his book before us, there are only two other mentions of him in the entire Bible. Both are in the book of Ezra, which I mentioned a moment ago is the historical record of the returns. And frankly, both of them have to do with the events of this book, as we will see. So the Ezra references really don't tell us anything that this book before you doesn't tell you. So little is known about him outside of the events of our book. In terms of his family, we have no record of his family line. Some speculate, you know, sometimes you'll see the prophet so-and-so, son of, son of, son of. We don't have that about Haggai. And so some speculate that perhaps he was from a poor family, a family of humble means. We don't know for sure about his age. There's some debate among scholars. Some believe, listen, try to follow. Some believe that he was born in Babylon, in the exile, and that he came back as part of the first wave of return. And so if that's true, he's probably a very young man when he writes. However, others say that he lived in Judah before the exile, before those 70 years, and now he's come back. So if that's true, he's a very older man. We don't know for sure. In terms of Haggai's ministry... I think this is interesting. Many believe he was a mentor figure to Zechariah, the next book of the Bible. Others believe he wrote up to eight of our psalms in the book of Psalms, Haggai. Still others think he was a priest. So many believe he was a a mentor, a a poet, maybe a priest. But we are going to focus, of course, on his prophetic ministry in this book. As a prophet, Haggai spoke the words of God to the returned people. This is an exciting time. They are back in the land. But listen, his book, which tells us of his prophetic ministry, only covers four months. Four months. In fact, there are some that believe that Haggai could have died right after the last message we read from him in chapter 2. Some think that he died in December of 520, and we'll get the timeline down as we go through the book. 
and that then his pupil Zechariah took over as the main prophet to the people, perhaps so. We have been introduced to Haggai in his book, the setting, Haggai the man. But folks, what I thought was critical for us to do this morning is secondly here, be introduced to God and his temple. God and his temple. I said at the beginning, we absolutely must need to understand the temple in order to understand this book. I want to make sure we start to have a handle on it before we dive into the text next week. And so what we're going to do right now is to remind ourselves of eight stages of the temple in God's word. Would you follow with me, please? Carefully and listen and get a grasp on the temple of God. What, what is that? What did it look like? Because when we open next week in the text, it's right there temple of God. Let's say this as we begin. The temple represented, this is the next slide, the temple represented God's dwelling place on earth. This is what it is, just a quick overview statement. The dwelling place of God on earth. The temple was a way that God revealed himself to his people in order to say, I am with you, I am choosing to dwell with you in this unique way. So what did this dwelling of God look like in the Scripture? How is it presented to us in the Scripture? Let's introduce ourselves first uh, to the, well, Let's introduce ourselves to this. Some of you, it might be kind of a reintroduction. First, write this down. Stage number one, we have the tabernacle stage, the tabernacle stage. Early on in Scripture, God makes it clear that he is choosing the nation of Israel to reveal himself through in the book of Exodus, God comes to the Israelites at Mount Sinai, and he says this. Listen and look at what Exodus 25 says. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the people of Israel that they take for me a contribution and let them make me a sanctuary, tabernacle, look, that I may dwell in their midst. Exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and all of its furniture, so you shall make that. God says, I will dwell with you in this special, special tabernacle, a movable tent. In Exodus uh, 29, uh, 26 through 39, then we see the description of the things that needed to go in there, including, listen, the Ark of the Covenant. And then in Exodus 40, the tabernacle is completed. And, and, and hear me, please. We have the glory of God coming upon the tabernacle. That's the first stage. Second, write it down. We're going to call this the split stage. The split stage. We see this starting in the book of Joshua. The exodus from Egypt has happened. The Israelites are conquering the promised land. The tab uh, tabernacle, listen, is set up in a city called Shiloh, the tent. But the Israelites got in the habit of taking the Ark of the Covenant out of the tabernacle and carrying it to various battle sites. That's why I call it the, the split stage. They would separate the Ark from the rest of the tabernacle. Now, why is that important? Keep in mind that in Exodus and Isaiah, it is clear that God said he would actually dwell above the seat of the Ark of the Covenant. You see these references here, Exodus 25, you shall put the mercy seat on top of the Ark, there I will meet with you above the Ark. Isaiah 37, Hezekiah, King Hezekiah, prayed to the Lord, Lord of hosts, God of Israel, enthroned above the cherubim on the ark. So God dwells above the ark, but keep in mind, God has said to put the ark in the tabernacle, in the tent. That according to Exodus 36, uh, excuse me, 26, it was to be placed in the most holy place of the tabernacle. So listen, follow. God dwelled above the ark, and that was to be in the most holy place of the tabernacle. But in Joshua's day, they began to take out the ark and carrying it around to different battlefields. 
And so to them, this began to represent God's presence with them in the battle, but the tabernacle itself remained in Shiloh. Now, eventually David becomes king, and David does something very interesting. Do you remember? You might recall he wants to bring the ark to Jerusalem to be with him, near him, as he rules from there. And so in 2 Samuel 6, he brings the ark to Jerusalem. But listen, he puts it in a tent that he made, not the tabernacle. That remained, by this time, in a place called Gibeon. And so, oh, by the way, we just so happen to see in 1 Chronicles 16 that, listen please, David goes and worships at the site of the ark in Jerusalem, but we're also told he goes to Gibeon and worships at the site of the tabernacle. It's split, do you see? He's worshiping at both sites. The ark and the tabernacle are separated from each other, really from the days of Joshua through the judges into David's reign. Both are seen as a dwelling place of God, and both, therefore, are viewed as places of worship. Number three, write down the temple planning stage. This one might be my favorite and most interesting temple planning stage. David gets to the point, you remember, in 2 Samuel 7, where he wants to build a permanent temple in Jerusalem. David says, why do I live in this glorious palace and God lives and dwells in a tent? He's convicted. His heart is in a good place to honor God, which, by the way, is a really key idea for our study, the book of Haggai. He wants to honor God with this temple. And yet God says in 2 Samuel 7, David, you are not the man that is going to build the temple. Instead, I will build a house for you, David, do you remember? Your line will reign forever, and oh, by the way, it will be your son who builds that temple. And then near that time, here's where I think it gets really interesting. Write down 2 Chronicles, excuse me, 1 Chronicles 21. 1 Chronicles 21. We see one of the most fascinating accounts in all of Scripture, I think. David sins against God. You remember, he, he, he counts the people. He takes a census of the people. And God punishes the Israelites with a plague that kills 70,000 people. The capacity of Kinnick Stadium, 70,000 dead in Israel. As people are, are dying from this plague, David looks up and he sees, do you remember the angel of the Lord with an out? stretched sword and ministering this plague over Jerusalem. The angel is standing over a certain field owned by a certain man, and David goes and buys that land. He offers sacrifices to God there. He prays that God might have mercy on them, and God answers the prayer. The angel puts away his sword. And do you remember what David says about that place? He says, quote, the house of the Lord is to be here. Listen, also the altar of burnt offering for Israel. Do you hear what he's saying? He is saying, in essence, everything must come together here at this place. The ark, the altar, the tabernacle, this permanent structure, everything here. No more split. And so David immediately makes plans for the temple on that location he understood to pass on to his son to build. Number four, we will call it then simply the temple stage, the temple stage. Solomon indeed goes on, we'll be quick with this one, and builds the temple of the Lord on that very site we just spoke of in Jerusalem. Here is a picture of it, and obviously an artist's rendering. You can read about this in 2 Chronicles 5. Solomon indeed brings in the Ark of the Covenant, no more split. Everything is indeed in one place as God intended it. And we see 2 Chronicles, the glory of the Lord. Once again, just like the tabernacle in the wilderness, the glory of the Lord filling this place, the temple. Number five, stay with me. The defilement and destruction stage, defilement and destruction 
This is where we were in Habakkuk, our last study. Solomon's temple remained standing for some time in Jerusalem, and yet, as you recall from Habakkuk, things got really bad. Solomon turned away from God. He introduced idol worship. The kingdom was divided. Many different kings, most of them evil. And as the prophet said, like Jeremiah, like Habakkuk, eventually Judah falls to Babylon because of their sin. And folks, when that happened, the temple of God, Solomon's temple, is what? Destroyed, leveled, 586 B.C. And looking back on this time, please hear me, looking back on this time, the prophet Ezekiel sees in a vision the glory of the Lord, what? departing, departing. The temple built for God's honor is in ruins. Please let this settle a bit on your mind. This is key for our book. The temple is in ruins. His glory has left because of the sin and defilement of the people. Number six, just a couple left. The rebuilt temple stage, the rebuilt stage. Again, key for our book. It starts with King Cyrus's decree to let the Israelites go back to the land from Babylon. According to Ezra 1, listen, Ezra 1, King Cyrus said, this is important, that the Israelites were to leave Babylon and their purpose was to go back and rebuild the temple, rebuild the temple. And so the first wave, the first group to return is led by a man named Zerubbabel. We will see him next week. They return, and the temple of God is eventually (laughs) rebuilt. And that word eventually is very key to our study. Here's a picture, an artist rendering again of the rebuilt temple. Notice anything different about it? Does it seem kind of small compared to the last one? Keep that in mind. That's in our book. So much of what Haggai is all about, folks. That's why we're going over it. To give you a little spoiler, we are going to see in this book that the people have not prioritized after 16 years the rebuilding of God's temple. It's a problem. There's other things they've prioritized. And God uses Haggai to change that. Number seven, let's call it the New Testament stage. Fast forward to King Herod after the intertestamental time, the time between the testaments. He wanted to build a a more glorious temple than, than what Zerubbabel had been able to do in his day, in Haggai's day. And so listen, roughly 20 years before Jesus was born, Herod did so. And it became known, pictured there by, I think that's a model, maybe an actual model you can see in in Jerusalem perhaps. It became known as Herod's temple. Herod tore down Zerubbabel's temple, but he built a bigger one on the same site. And of course, this is where we see Jesus teaching, Jesus healing. It's the temple that he cleansed when he drove out the money changers who were scamming the people. This is the temple that stood when he was crucified just a short ways away in the same city. But eventually, what happened to that one? This temple was destroyed in the year 70, 70 by I think, uh, did you say the actual person's name, perhaps, by Rome, by the Roman Empire and the Caesar? And folks, um, isn't this something? It has never been rebuilt to this day. It's never been rebuilt to this day. Seventy. Seven zero. Here, of course, is this is an actual picture. Um, of of that area now, what many believe is the ancient site of the temple of God in Jerusalem. Today, as you uh, very well may be aware, I hope that you are, it is comprised of the western wall of the temple, which is still sacred to uh, the Jews. Uh, But of course, it is also home to a Muslim mosque, which is pictured uh, uh, with a gold dome there in the center. 
For our final eighth stage, just jot this down and we'll come back to it at the end. We will call it the church stage. The church stage. What do we mean by that? (laughs) I would just ask you to file that away for five minutes here because we'll come back to it. The church stage. Folks, we have been introduced to Haggai in his book. We have been introduced, and I hope you find this helpful as we go along, to God and his temple. I'd like to begin to close our time now by looking at some first impressions of Haggai, some first impressions. When you meet someone, have you ever met someone for the first time and you walk away with a pretty strong impression of that person? That happens a lot, doesn't it? You meet him for the first time, you leave with a first impression. They're outgoing, they're shy, they're friendly, they're easy to talk to, they're fun to be around, they're crabby, you know, whatever the case may be. Whatever the impression, we often leave with one when we meet someone for the first time. Let me share with you five first impressions that stand out to me after we've been introduced a bit to Haggai, his book, and the temple of God. Here's number one. Would you write it down? Haggai was likely a prophet who had little previous fanfare and served for only a brief time. Haggai was a prophet who had little previous fanfare and served for only a brief time. We learned this morning we really don't know much about our man Haggai. Some speculation out there, maybe he was a priest, maybe he wrote some psalms, maybe he mentored the next book, Zechariah. But all of that is ultimately unknown. Really, all we know is the prophet Haggai. That's it. Nothing is known about his background or his family prestige. Nothing is known about position or titles. He simply, simply served the Lord. And on top of all of that, so far as we know, he served the Lord for these four months. Or better stated, out of all of the time that he did faithfully serve the Lord, we only know about 15 to 16 weeks of that time. Four months. All of that leaves an impression on me. Believer, I just encourage you this way. God can use any of us in powerful ways for his kingdom. If you are a born-again believer, it does not matter your family name. It does not matter where you grew up, your background, your social status. Now, God can use you, and God can use you in powerful ways. In fact, this is probably my favorite stat about Haggai, (laughs) favorite observation about him. Write this down. I love this. This nobody special prophet, nobody special prophet, holds a unique place in God's word among prophets. Haggai is one of the only prophets in the Bible who was actually obeyed by the people. (laughs) They listened to him. We're going to see that in a couple of weeks. It's rare. The prophet Jonah comes to mind as another example in his time in Nineveh. People listened and repented. It's pretty rare, though, in the Old Testament. Haggai is one of the only ones they listen to. God can use anyone in great ways, believer, including yourself. The other part of this impression is the short season of his ministry. Haggai's life of ministry is boiled down to four months for us. Commentator Ralph Smith says this, If this book contains all of his sermons, and so far as we know it does, Haggai's ministry only lasted 15 weeks. God calls some people for spot jobs. Haggai's job was to inspire the people to, spoiler alert here, initiate the rebuilding of the temple and to continue that in the midst of discouragement. And this he did with great effectiveness. I like that idea of spot jobs. Believers, sometimes some of God's most effective works through us are in short seasons. Of course, we should love Him and serve Him and walk with Him for a lifetime, but let's not forget the example of Haggai in the Scripture and, frankly, of Jonah and others. Sometimes God's most powerful work through us is in a short season. Believer, my encouragement is don't despise 
those ministry opportunities God brings to you because you think they are too short to be effective for the gospel. One morning, one hour-long lunch with someone, one week, one month, one, one short-term mission trip, one, one year, God can use the life submitted to him in powerful ways, even in short seasons. Here's a second impression that I see. Write this down. Haggai lived in exciting times. He lived in exciting times. Please remember this as we head into the text next week, folks. Remember the setting. These are exciting times. God has released his people from Babylonian captivity. That day of Babylon's judgment and Israel does, uh, Israel's deliverance has come. Do you remember that just from last week? Do you remember what Habakkuk said? I will sit quietly for that day to come, the day of Babylon's judgment and Israel's deliverance. It's come in this book. They're back. It's come to pass in Haggai's day. These are exciting times. As the prophet Haggai walked on, can you imagine this in your mind? He's walking among God's people back in the promised land, back in Jerusalem, having been released by Cyrus's decree to rebuild the temple of God. And yet, and yet, right off the bat next week, we will see how quickly things can go south due to sin and misplaced priorities. And therefore, God calls this man, Haggai, to speak. And he does so as the quote said, with great effectiveness. Third impression, building off our comments of the temple. Would you write down number three? The temple was the place that represented God's relationship with his people. Relationship. We spent a good bit of time on the, on the background of Haggai's, uh, excuse me, of the temple today. Please remember this, folks. It's important for our study. The temple of God was very much a relational place. It was the place where mankind can come to know God and worship him. God said, this is where I will dwell with man and you can come to know me. In Isaiah 56, God says, do you remember, my house, the temple, shall be a house of prayer for who? For all nations, all peoples. For all people to know who I am. Of course, Scripture is also very clear that God is much bigger than a temple structure built by man. His presence isn't limited to a building, but it was the unique place where man can come to know him and worship him. The temple was a relational place, a special place of God revealing himself. It represented relationship. Please remember this impression as we head into next week, because we're going to see that something was amiss with the temple in Haggai's day, and we need to know why it was a big deal. In part, it was a big deal because of relationship. Our fourth impression is this. It's along the same lines, but I think we need to distinguish it. Number four, the temple was a place that manifested God's honor and glory. What is the temple? Manifested relationship and God and uh, his honor and glory. Folks, this is huge. I, I can't stress it enough. It's a really important impression for us to understand heading into Haggai. The temple was a place that manifested God's honor and glory. I want, I want to share three very brief verses with you. And I want you to listen to them, and I want you to tell me what phrase or theme stands out to you, okay? Go ahead, James. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 12, but you shall, this is all about the temple. You shall seek the place the Lord our God will choose from among all your tribes to put his name there for his dwelling. To that place you must go. 2 Samuel 7, God to David. I will raise up your offspring to succeed you who will come from your own body, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name. Next one, thank you. Solomon's prayer to God at the dedication of the temple. May your eyes be open towards this temple night and day, the place of which you said my name shall be there. And then God answered, I have heard the prayer and plea you have made before me, Solomon. 
I've consecrated this temple which you have built by putting my name there forever. What's the theme? What's the word? Name. Name. What does it mean? It means the temple was the place of God's glory and honor. Listen, the temple represented his name, his character, who he was. And that, by the way, is why it was so offensive to God to see sin in the context of the temple. Does that help you relate to why Jesus was so upset at what was going on in the temple? Does that help you understand why King Manasseh of Judah in 2 Kings 21 set up idols? Listen, he set up idols for people to worship in God's temple and why that would be so offensive to God. He put them in the place of God's name, his character, his glory. Here's the bottom line this morning, folks. This is a little bit wordy. You don't have to copy it down unless you're a fast writer, or you can take a picture of it if you want. But here's what I would have you remember heading into our study. Here it is. God chose to reveal himself in the context of the temple in order to provide a place for relationship and worship and to display his glory and magnify his name and honor. That's the temple. That's the temple. That's what we must understand before we head into, Lord willing, next Sunday. Because we are going to see that Haggai has to address some big time problems with the temple. Finally, impression number five, and I end with this. Actually, I'll give a very brief word on our series after this, but this is really our last key thought. And it really attempts to bring the idea of the temple to today. What, what's the deal with it today? Brothers and sisters, in the eighth stage, be aware and be active in pursuing holiness. Be aware and be active in pursuing holiness. I'm speaking here to the distinct group of people who are born again believers in Jesus Christ. That is probably many of you in this room, but I dare not assume everyone or everyone watching later. I am speaking to those who have chosen to acknowledge your sin and your need for a Savior, and you have trusted in the one option that we have for that salvation, the person and the work of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. To you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, we must now revisit that eighth stage. I named it for you, but we didn't dive in. We call it the church stage but we did not get into the details of it. Since there is no physical temple anymore in the place God chose Jerusalem, what of this idea of the temple then today? We are left to ask today, well, where is God's special place of relational dwelling now? What, what is his method of disclosure and communion and relationship and his glory today? Where is the place where his name and, and honor and glory are displayed and magnified? Well, we're calling it the church stage. But we are not talking about a building, folks. Listen to what God's word says to us. The, the impact of this after looking at all of the temple stuff we have, this should be impactful to us. Look at what Paul says to Corinthian believers, followers of Jesus in 1 Corinthians 3. Do you not know that, say it with me, you are God's temple. And that God's spirit dwells in you. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him for God's temple is holy. We get that. And you are that temple. <laughs> Listen, brothers and sisters, it's you. You are God's temple. When you chose to place your faith in Jesus for salvation, the Holy Spirit of God came and took up residence in you. He dwells in you now. The believer, the follower of Jesus, is the temple of the living God. We are the, the special way that he is revealing himself to the wor world, along with the written word, of course. 
Listen, we, we bear his name. We are the temples that should bring him honor and glory and worship. All of those ways that we just talked about the temple, it's you, believer, follower of Jesus. It's not a building. It's you. And so, by the way, kind of a caveat here. What, what should be our view, then, of what we call the church building? What should be our view the building that uh, in any local church, a lot of local churches, I'll just speak for us, the building that God has blessed us with here at New Life, what should our mindset be? What should our view be of it? I believe the short answer is that we should view it as an area of stewardship, of stewardship. This building is a ministry tool that God has given us to advance His kingdom. It is to be cared for, it is to be used for His glory. It is to be used for the advancement of the gospel and the advancement of people's faith. It's an area of stewardship. But listen, please. We need not view it in the same light as God's temple in the Old Testament and in Jesus' lifetime. This building is not the dwelling place of God. That's you, believer. That is why you will sometimes hear believers lovingly push back or, or correct the idea of another believer saying, this is God's house. Have you heard that before? We don't need to do that in a mean-spirited way, but, but lovingly push back on that. This is God's house. No, 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 listen. It is to be used as a ministry tool to bring glory to God, but it is not the dwelling place of the living God. It's you. And so I would encourage us, yes, let's be good stewards of this building. Let's be good stewards of the property that God has given us. I hope that if you have been around New Life for a while, you know that we as elders care about that. We haven't been perfect in that area, but we care about being stewards of the building. But listen, if our concern over the sacredness of something is going to be directed anywhere, it should be directed to the child. The sacredness of something is you, not the building. It should be directed at your heart, believer, your body, your life. And then, of course, it should be directed at the lives of your brothers and sisters of Christ in Christ because that is the dwelling place of God. So with that awareness, what is our response? What is our response to that truth? Holiness, purity, distinctness, obedience, set-apartness to God. Romans 12.1, offer your bodies as living sacrifices to God. Listen to how Paul applies it in 2 Corinthians 6, just a few chapters after where we just were. For we are the temple of the living God, as God said, I will make my dwelling. Here's the theology. I'll make my dwelling among them and walk among them. will be their God. They will be my people. Since that is true, <laughs> since we have those promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing, I love this, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. How foolish, I, I saw the reaction on some of your faces, how foolish a couple of minutes ago when we said that Manasseh set up idols in the temple. How foolish is that? How foolish can you be to take an idol into God's temple and set it up in there for people to worship? What in the world is he doing? It makes no sense. That's exactly Paul's point in this verse, is it not? What sense does it make for us, believer, as God's temple to entertain sin in our lives? Should we not make every effort as God's temple to purify ourselves, to bring holiness to completion, as it says? If we are harboring unforgiveness, to forgive. If we're harboring bitterness, to make every effort to extend grace and live at peace. If we're entertaining sin through the meat, get rid of the device. If we're being lazy in the context of serving God, get busy using your gifts. 
if we're gossiping, slandering, cursing, being obscene, purify our lips. If we're not being the spouse that God would have us to be, get on your knees, get help, get accountability. If we're being selfish, start watching out for others. You get the idea. What we are saying is this, believer, be aware that we are God's temple and then be active to pursue what we sang so much about this morning, to pursue holiness. We are in the eighth stage. We are the dwelling place of God. We bear the name of God. We are the instruments of his honor and glory, ambassadors of Christ. God, help us to be a holier people as we draw very near to the year 2023. With all of this as an introduction and these impressions behind us, let me close with just a brief word on our series ahead. Our title will be Haggai Rebuilding the Temple, Refocusing Lives. Rebuilding the Temple, Refocusing Lives. In the book we are about to dive into, we find our prophet uh, Habakkuk, or excuse me, Haggai, I knew I would do that, Haggai, called by God to go to the people and encourage them to start getting to work. They've been released from Babylon to go back and rebuild the temple, but the work has come to a standstill for 16 years. And we're going to see that, listen please, the state of the temple mirrored the state of the people's spiritual lives. The people had neglected God's temple. They had neglected their relationship with God, their connectedness. And so our study will show us this beautiful connection between God's call for them to get to work on the temple and then also get refocused on their hearts. A key phrase, you might write this down, a key phrase in our book is consider your ways. Consider your ways. God says that to the people at least three times in this book through Haggai. Consider your ways. And so with that emphasis, we see themes emerge. This isn't just about rebuilding the temple. We see themes emerge that include holiness and seasons of spiritual dryness and obedience and repentance and discouragement and revival. And as the people began to build God's temple again, God is refocusing their hearts on him. Next week, Lord willing, we'll dive into the text together, Haggai 1.1. I would encourage you, here's one encouragement, read through the book twice this week. Would you do that? Read through the book twice. It's a great way just to get a, a handle on the book before you study it. It will probably take you no more than five to ten minutes to read through the book once, okay? Maybe even twice. I think I did it at a, a, a normal-ish pace, and it, I, I don't even know if it took me five minutes. So would you read through it twice? Get the big picture of where we're going, and then next Sunday we'll begin to look at this hidden gem together, the book of Haggai. Father, thank you for your word, though we did not read one word of the text today. We thank you for it, and we thank you for all of the, the background information that we can mine out from your word that, that relates to where we're at as we dive into Haggai. The temple, what that means, with the history of it. Haggai himself in the book of Ezra, but, but not really revealing anything new, Lord. We, we benefit from the rest of Scripture, speaking to Scripture in this case, informing us on this book before we begin. Lord, we thank you. I, I can't help but think of Christmas that is drawing quickly upon us and how John speaks of, of Jesus coming and, and tabernacling among us and dwelling among us. We celebrate the, the advent of our Savior, that he came and dwelled with us. And of course, we cannot help but think that you are coming again. We know that to be true. 
and in Revelation, as we saw in, in the last year or so as we studied that book, that the, the dwell, for eternity, the dwelling place of God is with man in the new heavens and the new earth. Oh God, what can we say to the realities that you love us, you care for us enough that you would dwell with us? You are merciful enough that you would do that. That not only would you come, but you would die for us, for our sin. And yet, Lord, it's, it's for your glory. It's for your glory, which is the supreme thing. We thank you. And we lift our praise to you in this final song before we dismiss. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? Let's sing this last song together.